take your questions, and as usual, folks, they gave me a list of the people I'm going to call on. So, uh, Jonathan, Associated Press. Thank you, sir. Uh, U.S. intelligence has said that Russia tried to interfere in the last two presidential elections and that Russia groups are behind hacks like solar winds and some of the ransomware attacks you just mentioned. Putin, in his news conference just now, accepted no responsibility for any misbehavior. Your predecessor opted not to demand that Putin stop these disruptions. So what is something that concrete, sir, that you achieved today to prevent that from happening again, and what were the consequences you threatened? Him? Whether I stopped it from happening again, he knows I will take action, like we did when this last time out. What happened was we, in fact, made it clear that we were not going to continue to allow this to go on. The end result was we ended up withdrawing them. They went and withdrawing ambassadors. We closed down some of their facilities in the United States, et cetera. And he knows there are consequences. Now, look, one of the consequences that I know, I don't know, I shouldn't say this, it's unfair of me. I suspect you may all think doesn't matter, but I'm confident matters to him, a confident matter to him and other world leaders of big nations. His credibility worldwide shrinks. Let's get this straight. How would it be if the United States were viewed by the rest of the world as interfering with the elections directly of other countries and everybody knew it? What would it be like if we engaged in activities that he is engaged in? It diminishes the standing of a country that is desperately trying to make sure it maintains its standing as a major world power. And so it's not just what I do. It's what the actions that other countries take, in this case Russia, that are contrary to international norms. It's the price they pay. They are not. They are not able to dictate what happens in the world. There are other nations of significant consequence, i.e., the United States of America being one of them. Mr. President, just a quick follow on the same theme of consequences. You said just now that you spoke to him a lot about human rights. What did you say would happen if opposition leader Alexei Navalny dies? I made it clear to him that I believe the, the consequences of that would be devastating for Russia. I'll go back to the same point. What do you think happens when he's saying it's not about hurting Navalny, this, all the stuff he says to rationalize the treatment of Navalny. And then he dies in prison. I pointed out to him that it matters a great deal when a country, in fact, and they asked me why I thought it was important to, to continue to have problems with the president of Syria. I said because he's a violation of international norm. It's called a chemical weapons treaty. Can't be trusted. It's about trust. It's about their ability to influence other nations in a positive way. Look, would you like to trade our economy for Russia's economy? Would you like to trade? And by the way, we talked about trade. I don't have any problem with doing business with Russia as long as they do it based on international norms. It's in our interest to see the Russian people do well economically. I don't have a problem with that. But if they do not act according to national norms, then guess what? That will not that only won't happen with us. It will not happen with other nations. And he kind of talked about that, didn't he, today? About how the need to reach out to other countries to invest in Russia. They won't, as long as they are convinced that in fact the the violations, for example, the American businessman who was in house arrest and I pointed out, you want to get American business to invest, let them go. Change the dynamic. Because American businessmen, they're not we're ready to show up. They, they don't want to hang around in Moscow. I, I mean, I look, guys, I know we make foreign policy out to be this great, great skill that somehow is sort of like a, a secret code. All foreign policies is a logical extension of personal relationships. It's the way human nature functions. And understand, when you run a country that does not abide by international norms, and yet you need those international norms to be somehow managed so that you can participate in the benefits that flow from them, it hurts you. That's not a satisfying answer. Biden said he'd invade Russia.
You know, it's not, you know. By the way, that was a joke. That's not true. But my generic point is, it is, it is, is more complicated than that. Um, David Sanger. I thought I just saw David. There he is. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in the run-up to this uh, discussion, there's been a lot of talk about the two countries spilling down into a, into a Cold War. And I'm wondering if there was anything that you emerged from in the discussion that made you think that he... Your permission, that, I'm going to take my coat off. The sun is hot. Anything that would make you think that Mr. Putin has um, decided to move away from his fundamental role as a disruptor, uh, particularly a disruptor of NATO and the United States. And if I could also just follow up on your description of how you gave him a list of critical infrastructure in the United States, did you lay out very clearly what it was that the penalty would be for interfering in that critical infrastructure? Did you leave that vague? Did he respond in any way to it? Uh, let me answer your first, well, I'll answer your second question first. I pointed out to him, we have significant cyber capability. And he knows it. He doesn't know exactly what it is, but it's significant. And if, in fact, they violate his basic norms, we will respond. Cyber. He knows. In the cyber way. Number two. I, uh, I think that the last thing he wants now is a Cold War. Without quoting him, which I don't think is appropriate, let me ask a rhetorical question. You got a multi-thousand-mile border with China. China is moving ahead, hell-bent on election, as they say, seeking to be the most powerful economy in the world, the largest and the most powerful military in the world. You're in a situation where your economy is struggling. You need to move it in a more uh, uh, aggressive way than in terms of growing it. And uh, you, uh, I don't think he's looking for a Cold War with the United States. I don't think it's about, a, as I said to him, I said, your generation and mine are about 10 years apart. This is not a kumbaya moment, as he used to say back in the 60s in the United States, like, let's hug and love each other. But it's clearly not in anybody's interest, your countries or mine, for us to be in a situation where we're in a new Cold War. And I truly believe he thinks that. He understands that. But that does not mean he's ready to, quote, figuratively speaking, lay down his arms and say, come on. He still, I believe, is concerned about being, quote, encircled. He still is concerned that we, in fact, uh, are looking to uh, take him down, et cetera. He still has those concerns. But I don't think they are the driving force as the kind of relationship he's looking for with the United States. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer Jacobs. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, is there a particular reason why the summit lasted only about three hours? We know you had maybe allotted a four to five hours. Was there any reason it ran shorter? Um, also, did um, the, President Putin said that there were no threats or scare tactics issued? Do you agree with that assessment that there were no threats or scare ta tactics? Yes. And also, did you touch on Afghanistan and the safe withdrawal of troops? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, let me uh, go back to the first part. Uh, uh, the reason it didn't go longer is when the last time two heads of state have spent over two hours in direct conversation across the table going into excruciating detail. You may know of time. I don't. I can't think of one. So we didn't need, as we got through when we brought in the larger group, our, our defense, our intelligence and our foreign, well, our, my foreign minister wasn't foreign minister. My secretary of state was with me the whole time our ambassador, et cetera, we brought everybody in. We had covered so much. And so there was a summary done by him and by me of what we covered. Labarov and Blinken talked about what we had covered. We raised things that required more amplification or made sure we didn't have any misunderstandings. And, uh, and so it was, uh, it was kind of after two hours there, we looked at each other like, OK, what next? What is going to happen next is we're going to be able to look back, look ahead in three to six months and say, did the things we agreed to sit down and try to work out, did it work? Do we, are we closer to a major strategic 
stability talks and and progress? Are we further along in terms of and go down the line? That's going to be the test. I'm not sitting here saying because the president and I agreed that we would do these things that all of a sudden it's going to work. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I think there's a genuine prospect to significantly improve the relations between our two countries without us giving up a single solitary thing based on principle and our values. No, 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 there, there were no threats. There were, as a matter of fact, uh, um, I heard he quoted my mom and quoted other people today. Well, there was, it was very, uh, as we say, which will shock you coming from me, somewhat colloquial. Um, and we talked about basic, basic fundamental things. There was a, it was, and the, you know how I am, I explain things based on personal basis. What happens if, for example? And so there, there are no threats, just as simple assertions made and no, well, if you do that, then we'll do this, was anything I said. It was just letting him know where I stood, what I thought we could accomplish together, and what, in fact, if it was, if there were violations of American sovereignty, what we would do. No, he asked us about Afghanistan. He said that he hopes that we're able to uh, maintain some peace and security. And I said that has a lot to do with you. He indicated that he was prepared to, quote, help on Afghanistan. I won't go into detail now. And help on, on, uh, on Iran and help on, and in return, we told him a lot what we wanted to do relative to bringing some stability and economic security or physical security to the people of Syria and Libya. So we had those discussions. Um, uh, Yamish. Thanks so much, Mr. President. Um, did you, you say that you didn't issue any threats. Were there any ultimatums made when it comes to ransomware? And how will you measure success, especially when it comes to these working groups on, on Russian meddling and on cybersecurity? Well, it's going to be real easy. They either, for example, on, on cybersecurity, are we going to work out where they take action against the ransomware criminals on Russian territory? They didn't do it. I don't think they planned it in this case. And are they going to act? We'll find out. Will we commit? What can we commit to act in terms of anything affecting, the, in, violating international norms that negatively affects Russia? What are we going to agree to do? And so I, I, I think we have real opportunities to, to move. And I think that one of the things that I noticed when we had the larger meet is that people who are very, very well informed started thinking, you know, this, this could be a real problem. What happens if that ransomware outfit were sitting in Florida or Maine and took action, as I said, on their, their, their single lifeline to their economy, oil? It'd be devastating. And they're like, you could see them kind of go, oh, we'd do that, but like, whoa. So it's, every, it's in, in everybody's interest that these things be acted on. We'll see, though, what happens from these groups we put together. Um, <laughs> the third one, yes. Go ahead. Um, Mr. President, when President Putin was questioned today about human rights, he said the reason why he's cracking down on opposition leaders um, is because he doesn't want something like January 6th to happen in Russia. And he also said he doesn't want to see groups formed like Black Lives Matter. What's your response to that, please? <laughs> My response is kind of what I communicated. But I think that's a, uh, that's a ridiculous comparison. It's one thing for literally criminals to break through cordon, go into the Capitol, kill a police officer, and be held unaccountable. And it is for people objecting and marching on the Capitol and saying, you are not allowing me to speak freely. You are not allowing me to do A, B, C, or D. And so they're very different criteria. Um, Steve, Steve Holland, Reuters. President, uh, sorry, President Putin said he was satisfied with the answer you, he, about your comment about him being a killer. Uh, could you give us your side on this? What did you tell him? He's satisfied. Why would I bring it up again? <laughs> and now that you talk to him, do you believe you can trust him? Look, this is not about trust. This is about self-interest and verification of self-interest. That's what it's about. 
So I uh, virtually uh, almost almost anyone that I would work out an agreement with that affected the American people's interest. I don't say, well, I trust you, no problem. Let's see what happens. You know, as that old expression goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We're going to know shortly. Um, Igor, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. Hello, Mr. President. Hello, Mr. You want to go in the shade? You can't. Can you see? Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think you know attacks in uh, civil society and uh, the free uh, free press continue inside Russia. Yes. Uh, for example, Radio Free Europe. Yes. Radio Liberty, Voice of America, Current Time TV channel where I work, uh, branded uh, foreign agents, uh, and uh, several other independent media. So, uh, we are essentially uh, being forced out in Russia 30 years after President Yeltsin invited us in. My question is, after your talks with President Putin, um, how interested do you think he's in improving the media climate in Russia? I wouldn't put it that way, <laughs> in terms of improving the climate. I would, in fact, put it in terms of how much interest does he have in burnishing Russia's reputation that is not as viewed as not being contrary to democratic principles and free speech? That's a judgment I cannot make. I don't know. But it's not because I think he, uh, he's interested in changing the nature of a closed society or closed government's actions relative to what he thinks is the right of government to do what it does. It's a very different uh, um, approach. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a couple of really good biographies. I told him I read a couple. I read most everything he's written and the speeches he's made. And, uh, and I've uh, read a couple of very good biographies, which many of you have as well. And I think I pointed out to him that um, uh, Russia had an opportunity of that brief shining moment after Gorbachev and after things began to change drastically to actually generate a democratic government. But what happened was it failed and there was a great, great uh, race among Russian intellectuals to determine what form of government would they choose and how would they choose it. And based on what I believe, Mr. Putin decided was that Russia has always been a major international power when it's been totally united as a Russian state, not based on ideology, whether it was going back to czar and commissars, straight through to the, the revolution, the Russian revolution, uh, and to where they are today. And I think that it's clear to me, and I've said it, that I think he decided that the way for Russia to be able to sustain itself as a great, quote, great power is to, in fact, unite the Russian people on just the strength of the government, the government controls, not necessarily ideologically, but the government. And uh, I think that's the that's the uh, choice that was made. I think it I I'm not going to second guess whether it could have been fundamentally different, but I do think it does not lend itself to Russia maintaining itself as one of the great powers in the world. Did the military response ever come up in this conversation today? Did you, in terms of the red lines that you laid down, is military response an option for a ransomware attack? And. President Putin had called you in his press conference an experienced person. You famously told him he didn't have a soul. Do you now have a deeper understanding of him after this meeting? Thank you, Thank you very much. But on the military, was military response, sir? No, we didn't talk about military response. In the spirit, Mr. President, of you saying that there is no substitute for face-to-face dialogue and also with what you said at NATO that the biggest problems right now are Russia and China. Uh, you've spoken many times about how you've spent perhaps more time with President Xi than any other world leader. So is there 
going to become a time where you might call him, old friend to old friend, and ask him to open up China to the World Health Organization investigators who are trying to get to the bottom of COVID-19. Let's get something straight. We know each other well. We're not old friends. It's just pure business. So I guess my question would be, uh, you've pr said that you were going to press China. You signed on to the G7 communique that said you, the G7 were calling on China to open up to let the investigators in. Uh, but China basically says they don't want to be interfered with anymore. So what happens now? The impact, the world's attitude toward China as it develops. China's trying very hard to project itself as a responsible and a very, very forthcoming nation. That they are trying very hard to talk about how they're taking and helping the world in terms of COVID-19 and vaccines. And they're trying very hard. Look, certain things you don't have to explain to the people of the world. They see the results. Is China really actually trying to get to the bottom of this? One thing we did discuss, as I told you in the EU and at the G7 and with NATO, what we should be doing and what I'm going to make an effort to do is rally the world to work on what is going to be the physical mechanism available to detect early on the next pandemic and have a mechanism by which we can respond to it and respond to it early. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we need to do that. Thank you. President Biden in Geneva wrapping up his summit, stopping. Let's listen. Why are you so confident he'll change his behavior, Mr. President? Yeah, I'm not confident he'll change his behavior. What the hell? What do you do all the time? So when did I say I was confident? You I said, said in the next six months I said, to what I said was, let's get it straight. I said, what will change their behavior is that the rest of the world reacts to them and it diminishes their standing in the world. I'm not confident of anything. I'm just stating the fact. But given his past behavior has not changed, and in that press conference after sitting down with you for several hours, he denied any involvement in cyber attacks, he downplayed human rights abuses, he even refused to say Alexei Navalny's name. So how does that account to a constructive meeting as President, President Putin? President? You don't understand that you're in the wrong business. Is there something China with China? China? Yeah. Who do we need to love? Who do we need to love quickly? Let's go. Quickly. So there you have it, President Biden walking off the stage. So there you have it, President Biden walking off the stage after taking questions, the solo press conference on the international stage following this historic, uh, and you cannot understate the fact that this was a high-stakes summit here in Geneva uh, with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, taking another question there at the end about uh, trusting Putin, how can you be sure that he'll change? And he said, I'm not sure that he'll change. Remember what I said multiple times in my answers, President Biden saying, I said, if if and that they now will have to wait, he said, six months with a number of these issues to get any indication if they're going to get any kind of change from Russia uh, moving forward. He reiterated that this face-to-face -face dialogue was extremely important moving forward with U.S.-Russia relations, that they need a stable, a predictable relationship. These were words used by the president and the White House uh, leading up to this summit. They talked about human rights. You heard him address Alexei Navalny there. Uh, he said at one point during this press conference that if he were to die, the consequences would be dire for Russia. But perhaps most importantly, in addition to uh, being nuclear powers, he also talked about cyber. The cyber attacks that we have seen in the United States, both uh, Western intelligence and U.S. intelligence agencies believing that they're uh, the Russian government, the solar winds hack, uh, the hack on federal government, several federal agencies and on private U.S. companies. And most recently, the, the hacks on the Colonial Pipeline and the U.S. meat supply. Uh, affecting the meat supply, gas prices in the U.S., believed to be attacks based in Russia, ransomware attacks. He said he did press uh, President Putin on this. We all heard Vladimir Putin this afternoon uh, taking no responsibility for that. But behind the scenes, President Biden saying it was quite simple. We said to Putin, what would happen if we did this to you, essentially? He said these were not uh, difficult um, questions to pose to Putin. We did it in very relatable terms. He said, what if someone in Florida or Maine was able to pull off this ransomware on your own oil pipelines? He said, of critical infrastructure, we have significant cyber capability. 
uh, that Putin doesn't know exactly what that cyber capability is, but he knows, and we have it. That was uh, as far as he would go as, as, uh, as far as offering an ultimatum or a threat, though the president was very careful, Martha Raddatz, not to use those words in answering reporters here today. He said there were no explicit threats or ultimatums, but again, he said, we have cyber capabilities, too, and we made that very clear to Vladimir Putin. And, and basically unrivaled cyber capabilities, and clearly he gave that message to Vladimir Putin, although without any threats, because he really didn't have to. And it, it, it seems that Vladimir Putin will keep denying that he did any cyber attacks, but he clearly got that message. I, I was fascinated by, by President Biden, how he approached Vladimir Putin basically saying, if you want to get back on the world stage, it's more than a photo opportunity. You have to do something. And it, particularly with Paul Whelan, one of the Americans who is being held prisoner in Russia, he said, he's a businessman. He was a businessman. If you want to attract business to Russia, let him go. So he's really appealing to that part of Vladimir Putin that wants to be more diplomatic, wants to be seen as a world leader, not just the authoritarian figure he is. You're absolutely right, Martha. The president, President Biden, repeatedly going back to this point, how does the world view Russia? He believes that that's the way to get to Vladimir Putin on a number of these issues. He told Putin that the world can see what you're doing with these acts of aggression. I want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. And Cecilia, uh, he made it very clear. He said that this is not a kumbaya moment. Uh, there's no love in the room. There's no one reaching out for a hug, uh, but that he made it clear to Putin that if you continue to act and behave this way, there will be consequences. He said, David, there's more work to do uh, ahead. That is exactly right. And I got to tell you, just reading the president there, I was just a couple of rows in, he was bothered by these questions on the back end, one from me, one from my CNN colleague, Caitlin Collins, when it came to these personal relationships. He came, he was leaving the microphone, the podium, and he came back over when he heard that question about how can you be so confident that he can be trusted, saying that I don't believe that he can be trusted. This isn't about trust. You'll remember he came into this verify then trust. He was bothered when I asked him if he'd learned any more about his personality and a better understanding of Vladimir Putin at the end of this two hour plus meeting because you'll remember he had famously looked at him and told him that he had no soul. Those were not the questions that he wanted to talk about, David. I just want to recap really quickly an important point here. The president did answer my question when I asked if military uh, response was on the table, if there was another cyber attack. And he said we did not talk about that in there today. Again, no explicit threats. And, and Cecilia, also, I took note that he didn't have a problem uh, bringing up that Putin had talked in his press conference about Biden's character, the fact that Biden had brought up his mother, uh, that this was a I, talk about I, family, that there were very personal terms in that room. Uh, but on the reverse, uh, uh, Biden was unwilling to go there. I, I think I heard Cecilia say, I'm sorry if you're talking to me. Perhaps she can't hear us. Cecilia, can you hear us? Uh, we'll come back to Cecilia in, in just a moment. Uh, I, I, the motorcade probably falling through. I'm just picking up bits and pieces in my ear. Perhaps that's why uh, the signal went down. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, watching this uh, along with us all day today. And John, you were the one uh, covering the previous president, President Trump, a very different summit in 2018 in Helsinki. Uh, that summit ending with a, a, a dual press conference, both leaders on the stage together. Very different what we witnessed here today. Uh, very different. Donald Trump seemed to want to uh, appeal to Vladimir Putin, admired Vladimir Putin, in some ways wanted to emulate uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, but the message from Putin was the same today as it was back in Helsinki. I mean, he denied everything. He denied any involvement uh, in, in the cyber hacks that we have seen coming uh, from Russia. Uh, he denied uh, that he was quelling political dissent, uh, said that these were uh, foreign, you know, basically foreign uh, uh, instruments that he was, uh, people like Navalny. Uh, but, David, you know, the bottom line is that Putin interfered in the 2016 election, interfered in the 2020 election against Joe Biden, invaded Crimea, uh, has had cyber attacks on the United States emanating from his country, and has largely gotten away with it. Uh, now we heard from uh, Joe Biden saying that Putin does not want another Cold War. It's clear that Biden doesn't want another Cold War either.
That's an extraordinary point you make, John Carl. Again, these are two leaders sitting across from one another, and U.S. intelligence believes one leader tried to affect the election. It didn't work out the way Putin wanted. He now sits across from President Biden on the world stage, and instead of the previous president, I want to get back to Cecilia Vega. Uh, Cecilia, we were on the air together a moment ago, and I was picking up a few words that you said. I'm guessing that the Secret Service, the motorcade going by, knocked out your signal for a moment. But the question I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned that Biden did not want to talk uh, about Putin and on personal terms and whether or not he saw more uh, of, of the leader as, as a man sitting face to face. On the reverse side, President Biden, I took note, uh, was willing to talk about what Putin had said about him personally, that he brought up his mother, his family, that, that there was a connection of some sort uh, in that room, a very basic connection. A very basic connection, David, but the president repeatedly said this was not a kumbaya moment. In fact, I, I think he said along the lines of we're not friends. Um, but this is President Biden who has been on the world stage for a very long time, given his 26 years in the Senate on the Foreign Relations Committee. He has met Vladimir Putin before. He is no stranger to foreign policy. And he said this up there today. His goal in this was to have a face-to-face -face dialogue that he firmly believes that the foundation of this relationship with Russia right now, though it may be at rock bottom at a potentially all-time low. Both sides agree on that. The president saying now that they have had this face-to-face -face conversation, they've got these working groups now meeting on these crucial issues facing both countries, they believe this is a step in the right direction. As he said, David, though, more to come. No question about that, Cecilia. In fact, he said six months from now, perhaps even longer than that, we'll know. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. He gave us many of his sayings, one of them right there, uh, whether or not Putin acts on any of these things he's now promised to act on, including uh, the cyber attacks. Uh, the president repeatedly said there were no specific ultimatums, no, if you do this, I'll do that. These were basic, fundamental things. And again, he spoke to Putin on terms that the president believes Putin would understand. What if these ransomware attacks that we've seen in the U.S. were to start happening in Russia and again said we have significant cyber capability? I want to bring in Terry Moran now, who was in the room in Helsinki in 2018 with these two leaders, former President Trump uh, and Putin, former President Trump uh, choosing Putin, saying, I, I believe him. Uh, when he denied meddling over his own U.S. intelligence teams today. As Cecilia has just pointed out, uh, President Biden was very careful and very direct to say there is not a personal relationship here with this leader of Russia.